pirates in the 17th and 18th century are often portrayed as lawless individuals with only self-gain in mind. For example, Gentlemen, my lady, you will always remember this as the day that you almost caught Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> Although, this does not apply to a large part of the piracy and privateering happening in the Boston area. In these cases, the pirates and local governments worked hand in hand for each of their interests. Piracy will crop up here and there around the world, never quite on the same scale as it was. So it's not a continuous history, but you can say that the image of the pirate is continuous. Right. Especially once it became uh, a central part of popular culture. When the presence of piracy became consistent in the New World, in particular the Northeast, prominent public figures quickly took advantage of this new business to create an anonymous influence. This allowed them to have an outside control over trade, control crime, and act as a proxy for government business, and most importantly, give them riches from the pirates' spoils but often ended in the pirates' demise. The New England pirates were exotic anti-heroes with a long historical tradition often compared to witches. Where the pirates achieved especially spectacular prominence in early modern Europe, the pirate kings of America have been represented romantically as Robin Hood figures challenging the oppressive economic and political establishment of their day. For example, William Kidd was a Scottish seaman who was mistaken to be a notorious and leading pirate in the world, but in truth, he was an unsuccessful and atypical sea robber that gained notoriety by crossing his business partners. A major group of Whig politicians invested in his plan as solvent partners and provided privateering commission. This partnership included warrants to conduct his business without regulations like killing crew on captive boats. He went on to London and New York to find a crew which consisted of some other pirates. Kidd got involved with many political crimes rather than piratical ones and constantly sought the patronage of powerful political leaders. He operated under the weak shield of an unusual anti-piratical royal commission for a relatively brief period. Kidd sailed from New York on September 6, 1696, for the government sponsor's goal to capture some of the Red Sea pirates who were outraging the politically influential East India Company of London. He returned to Boston on July 6, 1699, and was arrested by one of his Whig sponsors, the Earl of Bellamont, Governor General of New York and Massachusetts. In the report of his mission, Kidd stated that he carefully confined his captors to Moorish ships and those carrying French passes, but he missed the pirates against whom he was commissioned. His Whig patrons feared that he would involve them in disreputable dealings with pirates in the future. In addition, the Whig's Tory enemies resented Kidd's failure to do so, which rendered him useless and a liability for both sides. Thus, Kidd's rise to fame and downfall are more reflective of politics than of piracy. Kidd was ultimately sacrificed for parliamentary politics of commerce and to the determination of the English executive to erase all challengers to its monopoly of violence. Fastidious, patriotic, and unsuccessful in his task, Kidd was arrested, tried, convicted, executed for piracy when far more offensive pirates were pardoned. Kidd was trapped either by his outrageous informers or by a fatal slowness to recognize the political price of pardon or by both. The people called Kidd a rogue and Kidd was therefore found guilty of an irrelevant murder and an incidental piracy and hung in chains because neither political party would intercede with the king on his behalf. William Kidd had become a political liability because the ever more censorious English legislatures had last become aware of the incompatibility of traditional English piracy 
with modern international commerce. Another notable sailor getting influence in the Northeast was Thomas II. He plundered merchants in the Boston Harbor and used it to bribe governors of Boston, which made them grow rich quickly. During the American Revolution, colonist leaders took the initiative of using privateers to loot British supply routes. European traders stockpiled desirable European goods in anticipation of higher prices in the wake of hostilities. The American revolutionaries bottled up Savannah Harbor in 1775 with the power of plundering anything that arrives in the British Harbor, which provided a great advantage for the colonists. Under the command of George Washington, Massachusetts skippers had been converting their fishing and cargo boats to bare bones warships for several months. The Congress agreed that a great means of protecting their own trade is also picking up many British provision vessels. Massachusetts lawmakers supported a plan that was expected to play a harassing role at best to the British. Privateers were envisioned as a third element of a nautical triple threat featuring continental warships for ocean combat and mid-sized provincial vessels for coastline defense. Massachusetts General Court permitted citizens to equip any vessel to sail on the seas, attack, take and bring into any port in this colony all vessels offending or employed by the enemy. Groundwork was laid out for obtaining commissions to organize and assess the goods that were stolen from the British to award the privateers. Washington's pirating system deemed one-third of a prize's value to be sufficient for his sailors, with the remaining two-thirds going down to the government. With this new system, many British supply ships were boarded and hijacked in Boston Harbor by privately funded privateers. Many wealthy merchants leased their large vessels to the government at premium rates. The owners of the vessel were able to install their own leads of the ship who would pick the crew. Washington turned to local officials to help him assemble crews for his piracy acts in Boston. These privateer ships would make history transporting 2,400 troops across the wintry Delaware River in Washington's famous Christmas Crossing. The privateers often faced conflict with Washington and his guidelines for hijacking British vessels. He was instrumental in getting them to sea, but bore the same conflicts of interest and recriminations that soured other business patriotic endeavors. Washington faced a lack of builders, project delays, and cost overruns. The performance of his captain overseeing the operation almost caused him to abandon it altogether. Fearing to stray far from the port, pirates preyed on ships cruising near the shore between New Hampshire and Point South, the same routes favored by area merchants, whose ships they seized in triumph. Prize for recapturing prizes deemed to be very complicated when dealing with the privateers. The legal criteria on the prize given was selected through how long the prize was in the enemy's hands, how difficult was its recapture, on which base prize awards and paybacks from owners would be used to recapture their lost property. The crew became disappointed with the strict guidelines, and 36 seamen of Morton's crew mutinied in Washington was not sympathetic of their actions. American inmates at Fulton and Mill Prison had only escaped death or consenting to join the Royal Navy as a means of freedom. These uncontrollable government associations can be paralleled to state-sponsored terrorism happening in our world today. Organizations such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS developed from pacts between the U.S. supporting a rebel group for what seemed to be a greater good at the time. Even though this has occurred in the past, officials failed to recognize the long-term effects supporting causes to distance themselves from their own problems and tasks.